So that's me. I am Kate Adams, uh, not senior marketing manager, but SVP of marketing at Validity. Uh, prior to joining Validity, I was at a company called Drift, which if you're in the B2B space, you might uh, have been familiar with. And uh, I've been doing demand gen, been doing this marketing thing for, I can't believe it, 18 years now. Uh, and so I'm pumped to be here with you today. That's my uh, that's my LinkedIn. So I'm ha I'd love to connect with you. I geek out uh, connecting with other marketers and, and hearing what you all have to say. Uh, this is the only slide that talks about validity, but at validity, we believe that businesses uh, acquire, engage, and retain customers when they have high quality data at their fingertips. That's what we firmly believe, right? And so whether you are a marketer and you're thinking about how you're planning and developing that campaign all the way through to analyzing the performance of it, and then finally ingesting all of the data associated with that campaign that you just got, we have a solution for you. But let's talk about what you're going to hear from me today and what we're here to discuss. Uh, we're going to talk about five key email plays, which, spoiler alert, I actually have seven because I'm an overachiever. I can't just give you five, right? And so we've got seven key email plays that you can use today to in, uh, improve the performance of your overall email program, whether you're B2B or B2C, which is fascinating to see that this room uh, was split in half and uh, so we're going to talk about where are we now with our email programs. In there, you're going to get all of the benchmark data that you need to arm yourself about why you need to be paying attention to your email program. And then we're going to talk about how to blow past them with those seven, not five plays, right? So let's talk about overall email volume. So here's a graph of overall email volume. It starts in January of 2020, and all of a sudden... Uh, this is not a coronavirus chart. Ironically, this is actually uh, this is actually a chart that shows email volume. And in March of 2020, you see an enormous spike, an enormous spike there, right? Overnight in 2020, email volume increased by 60% as COVID-19 hit. And over the last two years, email volumes never came back down. It didn't matter that you and I are sitting in a room, and I can't believe I'm saying this, maskless right now, right? Email volumes are still up higher than ever before and climbing. And so if you zoom in here on just the last 12 months, you can see uh, we spike here as it relates to uh, December, which is everybody's got those Black Friday holiday deals going. You're trying to make the end of the year, right? We're all pulling at every straw we can to get to that number. And then you see it spikes again around uh, Valentine's Day and end of the quarter, right? Um, let's dig in. So if you, if you don't know already, I am a big data geek. So you're going to see a lot of data here. So open rates. Uh, this is the blue line on this chart is open rates. Uh, we were thumping around here at 25%. Anybody care to give a shout out at what happened in September that is spiking open rates significantly? Did we all just become incredibly better email marketers? We finally figured it out. What do you got? The Apple privacy update. Exactly right. The Apple privacy update. So mail privacy protection was rolled out by Apple in September. So the bad news is we didn't all just get magically better at, email, at writing subject lines overnight, right? Uh, now, if you're not familiar with that, your mail looks like it's opened because an Apple proxy server is actually opening all of that mail before anybody actually gets it. So even if it's not an Apple email address that is happening, if, it's, if they have their mail connected to the mail client on their iPhone, which owns 40%, which owns 40% of the 60% of the mobile market right now, uh, then you are actually seeing all of that mail opened. And then click through rates. Uh, ironically, we've been hovering and bouncing around 4.24% here, but you can actually see that click through rates actually start taking a nosedive just as uh, MPP or mail privacy protection starts coming out, right? So as of January of 2022, Apple proxy opens actually represented 67% of global email opens. 
That was as of January. Let me show you the most recent data. I'm zooming in here again on the last 12 months. You can actually see our average open rate before in 2021 was about uh, 30%. You can actually see that proxy server is now getting us almost close to 40%. Not real opens, right? Because Apple owns so much of that market. And you can see that the average click-through rate, we were hovering right about 5%, bouncing up 4 and 5%. And we've taken a big old hit, we've taken a big old hit in clicks, right? And so the global average open rate for 2022, 2021, 30%, 30 to 35%, depending on how much uh, Apple is in your database. The global average click-through rate is 4%, but that is trending down. That is trending down the more data comes along. And the last stat I have for you is the average inbox placement rate, right? So how much of that mail, because it's amazing, right? Your email service provider, it's like magical. It's a magical moment. You hit send and ta-da, your mail is in everybody's inbox. That is a complete lie, right? That's a complete lie. They show you, we delivered 98% of your mail and great news, right? But the reality is one in every six of the emails that you're sending are not getting into the inbox. And by the way, when I'm defining inbox, I am actually counting the promotions tab in Gmail. That counts as an inbox placement, right? So meaning you're getting directly into the spam folder, right? And so when you look at that, the global average inbox placement rate for 2021 20, in totality was 85%. And then when we zoom in there, I'm the bearer of great news today. I know. I don't have an accent. I'm talking about how I packed my car somewhere. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm sharing all this bad news with you. But the average inbox placement rate, that is also going down as well, right? It's also going down. We're seeing it now hitting 80%. Why? Because all of those mailbox providers are trying to, they just got inundated, not just, but two years ago, they got inundated with the flurry of all the more email marketing that we all have been sending for the last two years. And their subscribers are telling them, whoa, whoa, this is too much, right? This is too much on me. I can't deal with all this stuff. You gotta help me out. And so in uh, a lot of those mailbox providers, Yahoo, Gmail, et cetera, they are doing, they're now taking it into their own hands because they're saying, marketers, you, you aren't listening. You're not taking the signals, right? You just, keep, you just keep sending more and more and more and you can't do it because people aren't engaging with it. We got to stop. Um, complaint rate. So is anybody familiar, show of hands, what, are you familiar with what com e email complaint is? Not just somebody emailing you being like, you are so annoying. It's not that. An email complaint is actually uh, when somebody complains to their, their, their mailbox provider, right? So you hit a button in Gmail that says, I don't want this message. That's not an opt-out, right? An opt-out is when they tell you that they don't want your message and say, remove me from the list. They're telling them their mailbox provider. So the average complaint rate is about 0.03. But what I want you to pay attention to here is this spike in October and November. That's a haywire spike, 0.06%, double what we saw as the average. Let me show you opt-out rate. So this is opt-out rate. This is when somebody actually tells you, please remove me from your list. I no longer want to receive your messages, right? I know we're all marketers in the room. It pains us. It pains me to even say it. How could you not want to receive my messages? <laughs> I worked so hard, right? And so, but here's the, here's the thing I want you to see here. Look at this dip in opt-out rate. At the same time, October, November timeframe, that complaint rate spiked. I don't know about you, but I pay really close attention to the mail that I get in, in my, on my iPhone. Apple actually said, hey, let us know at the top of their messages. Let us know what you think about this message. Is this message relevant to you? Nope. So my, the question I posit to all of you is, is complaint rate the new opt-out rate? And it's like the worst, right? Have, all right, raise your hand if this has ever happened to you. You've been at a party. You see a group of people that you haven't seen in so long. 
You walk over to them, you have a great conversation, and then you walk away. And you can feel it. What are they talking about? All the things you just said. You, right? Like, you know it. You know it. That's what your subscribers are doing to you right now. They're not telling you what they think to your face. They're telling the mailbox provider what they think of you. You've lost control, right? You have no control over that. Um, so here's the more good news. We have an engagement crisis on our hands right now from an email perspective. And it's up to us to do something about it. But one thing I know for sure is that what got us here is not going to get us to where we want to be, right? Thank goodness email was there for us. I mean, I, I wish I had a dollar maybe for every time I read the headline, email's dead. Guess what wasn't dead of March of 2020? And thank goodness it was there for all of us, right? As we all of a sudden, every marketing strategy that we had got thrown out the window. And it was like, we still got to grow, figure it out. Oh, and by the way, for most of us, we got to grow with less people. So now you've got to really figure it out, right? Thank goodness email was there for us. But now we've got to get better at it, right? We can't be scrambling anymore thinking, oh my gosh, we're in crisis. Just send the emails. Just get, send more emails. Send more emails. We'll get there. We need to start to think, how do we send fewer emails that are more engaging to get better outcomes, right? So play number one, tokenization versus personalization. Uh, my, my colleague, Kat, who I am privileged to work with every single day, uh, is rolling her eyes for the 17th time at me right now because she's so exhausted of hearing me talk about this. But this is a little thing here. Um, tokenization equals F name, right? This is the syntax for my ESP, Marketo, right? This is how I throw, <laughs> this is how I put your first name in there. Tokenization is the F name, right? Oh, oh my gosh, congratulations everybody. You personalized your email, golf clap, right? Golf clap. That is not personalization, right? Personalization is show me that you know me. So how are you gonna do that? Well, you know, you may know what products I own, right? You may know what my hometown is. You may know what my closest store location is. You may know what's in my cart right now. You know all of those things and you own that data. And so the consumer is so exhausted of us as marketers telling them, oh, they, they know the game now right? They get it. They get what's going to happen when they fill out the form. They get what's going to happen when they get that 10% coupon so that it gave you their email address. And they are demanding more from us. They are saying, great, okay, I'll give you that thing in exchange for the thing that you're going to give me, but then use my data intelligently and get me better offers right? Saw so it in the lob presentation. I love that example of personalization that somebody loved yellow. So they sent them that yellow card in the mail, right? Like, you know, all of these things about the subscribers who are on your email list. It's up to us to use it, right? Don't pat yourself on the back because you threw in an ESP token, really get dynamic with your email campaigns. Um, play number two, go against the grain. If I had $5 for every time I had read a headline that was like, the best time to send your email is Tuesdays at 9 a.m., right? And then we're kind of all like lemmings and we're like, Tuesdays at 9 a.m., Tuesdays at 9 a.m., right? <laughs> and then until the next article came out from HubSpot or somebody, it was like, the best time to send your email is Wednesday at noon. And then we're like, Wednesdays at noon, <laughs> right? Go against the grain, right? I was doing one of these uh, a few weeks back and somebody there had actually told me in their preference center, they actually enable their subscribers to say, do you want to hear from us during business hours or after business hours? And she was in a, an anti-aging cream um, company, right? And by providing that context and sending it after business hours, she 3 x her email engagement as a result of that. Right, because what do you do with your personal emails, right? You get out of work after a long day. For me, it's like I sit on my couch at eight o'clock after the kids are in bed and like I'm staring at, I put some mindless Bravo show on 
to watch. And now I'm like, okay, let me clean this up. Delete, 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 right? And so, because this all happened while I was sitting at work, I don't have time to deal with this, right? But if you can get, if they could send me a message at 8.30, well, I'm already in my inbox already. Like, oh, I just saw this arrive, right? Pretty fascinating stuff. So don't be a lemming, right? Find out what your subscribers want. Just because it, for on average across everything, Tuesdays at nine is a great time. Doesn't mean that's true for your business, right? Doesn't mean it's true for the CRM admins that I'm marketing to or the people who order fast food that you're marketing to or whatever it is, right? Uh, play number three, use your data. Use your data, right? So there have already been references today about how we're going to the cookie-less world, right? We're, we're going to, uh, you know, we're not going to have access to the data that we have. And as a B2B marketer, at least, everyone is trying to sell me intent data. It feels like every five minutes I get another email from, an SD, from a poor SDR telling me about why their intent data is the best intent data I've ever seen in the whole world right? But use your data. Like we're, as marketers, we're, I feel like what we've done is like, buy, 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 buy all this data. How do I enrich my data? How do I augment my data? But you have so much data today already and you're not even using it, right? You're just, you're throwing the token in and calling it a day and saying like, oh yeah, I carry, I capture that data so that sales can use it. Sales needs to personalize. No. Marketing needs to personalize more too, right? Play number four, make the opt-out bigger. Here's a news flash. You aren't fooling anyone with your number four times New Roman font. Like you aren't, it's okay. I promise, I know this feels counterintuitive, right? And I know that in order to be in compliance with CanSpam, we all went and added the opt-out language to every email and put it in the footer and made it size four and crossed our fingers that nobody ever found it. But everybody knows where that is now, right? Everybody knows where that is. And now what I just showed you on the complaint data is that the mailbox providers are actually doing it for you right? They are doing it for you, but they're capturing the data, not you. So you don't know that that person doesn't want to engage with you anymore. And the more complaint data that all those mailbox providers get on you, they are actually using it as a signal that nobody wants to get your mail. This, this sender is a bad sender. They're not listening to their subscribers. Nobody wants to get your mail and they're putting you in the spam folder right? And so make the opt-out bigger. Next week, I am moving the opt-out to the top of every single one of my email campaigns. It'll be the first thing that everybody sees. And every marketer on my team wants to crawl into a hole and is like, what is this crazy person doing? <laughs> right? But I promise you, I know that I think, I think, and maybe I'll stand in front of you here in six months and tell you what a big mistake I made. Uh, but I believe that by doing that, I will get more engaged subscribers, people who actually want to engage with me and that our email program will be better off at the end of the day. Um, speaking of that, blow the dust off your preference center. You know that thing that we all built in 1992 and had some developer come in or took out of the box, took the out of the box version from whatever ESP or CMS we had and said, yeah, cool. I need this for compliance. So here's my preference center. Like let's blow the dust off that preference center. A preference center isn't just, shouldn't be where somebody just goes to get off your list. A preference center should be where I go to tell you what my preferences are. And so instead of pointing that opt out to just like, yes, no, binary, right? Is it black or white? This is what I'm going to do. And instead, I can tell you, hey, send me your emails after business hours and I'll read them. Hey, send me emails on this topic, not that one. I'm not interested in hearing about it. Hey, I want to hear from you once a week, not twice a week. Hey, it's okay. I want to hear about your webinars. I'm not interested in your eBooks. I don't have time to read them. Whatever it is, right? 
hey, I want to hear about rides. I don't want to hear about meal delivery. Hey, I want to hear about uh, pet sitting, but I don't care about childcare. Whatever those things are, allow somebody to tell you that because then that's your data, right? That's your data. Two bonus plays. That was number five on the preference center. Number six, implement BIMI, brand indicators for message identification. Has anybody done this yet? So at Yahoo and, and uh, soon at Gmail, uh, you know that when you, when you get an email from somebody, it will show, like if I sent you an email to your Gmail address, it'll show a circle with a K in it, right? Right next to it before you open it. As a brand, I can actually put my logo in it. You can actually put my logo in that um, space. So every time, imagine how many brand impressions that is then. Every time I send an email, that's a brand impression in somebody's inbox before they've ever opened it. It also protects me when uh, somebody may spoof my uh, spoof me, right? Sends an email as validity. They're like hacking is through the roof right now, right? For a number of different reasons. If somebody spoofs me as a sender, trying to get uh, my subscribers information, and I don't have that on, it would be an indicator to the subscriber, hey, this isn't a legitimate message from, I don't know, Target, right? But if it has that Target logo in it, man, I know it's a great deal from them, right? That's another way to increase engagement. And the last one, let's redefine what engagement means. So accelerated mobile pages AMP, right, works in the Google, uh, in all Gmail apps. Uh, it works on all Android devices. I've actually seen email 2.0. I saw a developer actually create an email where they could make a purchase in that email, never go into a website. They made a purchase in that email, never leaving the actual message itself. I actually saw he had it wired up a game of Wordle. Wordle in the email that you could play in real time in the email using AMP, using accelerated mobile pages, right? It's not going to work for Apple, but it's going to work for some part of your list. It's something to consider. How else can you redefine engagement? Why don't you ask somebody a question in your email, right? And it doesn't have to be, I'm not saying like ask a question that is the most earth shattering thing. Like when is, when are you going to buy from me? Why not ask them what book are you reading? What books are you planning on reading this summer? That's a positive indicator to all those mailbox providers like Gmail, like Yahoo, et cetera, all those folks that people want to receive your messages, right? And they are engaging with them. They're looking at all those mailbox providers are looking at who's opening your mail and they can actually see the real opens not uh, un unlike you who are blind for that, thanks to uh, mail privacy protection, right? They can see who's opening it, how much time they're spending in that message. So how much they've read it and who's replying to it. All of those things are positive signals to mailbox providers like, hey, th these folks are great senders. These folks are reputable senders. People are engaging with those their messages. I'm gonna put them in their inbox. Because one in six of every single one of your messages isn't landing there. So redefine engagement could be to take a survey, right? It doesn't always have to be, did they open it? Did they click through it? And done, right? We got to do better than that. And I know we can. Um, I'm the only thing that is standing in between you and lunch right this second. <laughs> and I am very much aware of that. I have this free gift for you, the five minute guide to email deliverability. That QR code will get you access to that. Um, for free. Um, and with that, Ross, I'll open it up to questions. <laughs> Don't trust me with that. Um, so, Kate, okay, you, you were talking about utilizing your own data. But in in global organizations, especially where like the data is so dirty and so almost useless because it's been data for like 250 years, literally. Yeah. What is your advice other than adding a tool to clean the data or adding like a, 
whatever it, whatever it is. How can we better utilize data? Because I feel like we buy intent data as a hope for like this time we're gonna get it better because this is gonna be clean data other than what we already have on the on our systems. Yeah. So what would be your recommendation in something like that? So it's interesting because when I think about intent data, I think what's the problem you're trying to solve with intent data? Mm -hmm. and the problem you're trying to solve with intent data is who's in market, right? That's what you really mm -hmm. want to know, who's in market. And so for me, that kind of all, I go back to, well, I, I have that in my own data today. So I can't see it really with open rate data, but who's actually clicking on my emails? Who's engaging there? Who's replying to me? Right. I can see it in my in my own first party website data. I know who's coming to our website over and over again. I know who's reading my blog. I know all of those things. Right. I know who's clicking on my ads on LinkedIn. I can I have all that data. Right. So I would go use that data. But right now for as B2B marketers learning and what we're not doing is like using it. We're just capturing it. I would, I would say very few of us are actually using it very well. The other thing in terms of improving the quality without a tool, right? Without a tool, improving quality of your data, put an expiration date on it. If you haven't verified and validated something within a certain time frame, I would say count it as expired. The data on the data side of our business for B2B organizations, uh, there's, a, there's a spike just like for email data uh, that COVID has caused as well right? COVID caused it because initially from layoffs, and then we went through the great resignation, and now we're going through the great unresignation of people uh, moving jobs. So they quit, and they came back, and then they're everywhere. So B2B orgs used to, their database used to deprecate at 33% a year. It's like 70% right now. It's 70% with how fast it's getting out of date. So I think you have a sudden a uh, uh, an expiration date on it at some Makes point, sense. right? If it's more than 12 months old, I don't know if it's still good. <laughs> it is way older than yeah. that. Yeah. Right, right. Um, the data in the beginning that you were showing, where did you pull that from? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a great question. Probably would have been good to mention. Um, <laughs> the data I pulled in originally, so uh, that's on our network. So we collect more than 10 billion data points, email data points around the world globally. So we have the biggest uh, network, email network um, in the market, right? And so it's based on all of that data. Okay. Yeah. And then my other question, the BIMI, am I saying that correctly? Yeah. So can you do that with like automated messages and like if you're sending out to a large list rather than just like a one-off email? Yes, that's what you do. So you set that for automated messages. So you oh. have to do a couple of things like you need to uh, implement DMARC in your organization and your email program. And then you need to go through, uh, we help organizations do this, but you have to get certified and like show proof of your, of the fact that you own the trademark. And then once you do that, you can implement. Uh, okay, those are my only Great two questions. questions. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts or considerations um, when you're looking at like paid email lists versus organic email lists or like, your owned email lists? So, I like say. somebody sending on your behalf? Or like if you're trying to reach a target audience and you pay for a list versus. Um, using your customer list. This is going to be controversial, but I don't pay for a list. I won't do it. And um, Kat's shaking her head back there too. She's like, "Yep, she won't do that." Um, yeah, I I don't pay. I won't pay for a list. I will pay to be in somebody else's email list, but even then, I'm vetting it pretty carefully and making sure that it's a reputable sender and somebody who, who's doing things well, I'll pay for it to be on that list. Like So like a newsletter? Mm -hmm. Okay. Or a dedicated send, like the AMA like will do a dedicated send for me. Or um, marketing brew, getting it in there, right? Any one of those things um, I'll do. And then it's up to me to make a really compelling offer in there to want those subscribers to engage. But I won't buy an email list because 
the what I risk in doing that and then sending it out via however I'm going to send that out, which is not going to be a good way, is just going to cause me, it's going to give me a lot more pain moving forward um, than it will for the short term gains I might get. So, the so the strategy is more so pare down your current list rather than trying to add on less quality. Yeah, exactly. Exact. My strategy is what I'm always thinking about is how do we have the single best offer that want that gets people to engage, right? So, like for us, we have a tool called senderscore.org at senderscore.org that tells you your sender reputation where you can look it up. How do we create great tools that people want to engage with that, by the way, are super valuable? and help people. And so that's what I'm pushing my product organization to do. Like on the, on the data side, it's like, now we can assess your CRM. And so great, I will wanna go sell that, that's helpful. Great, do an assessment. And by the way, if you wanna buy the tool that goes with it, great. But if you don't, that's okay. At least you got the assessment. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Uh, great presentation. And I've got to tell you, I have been using personalization instead of tokenization for probably five years now. You're absolutely correct. It is the way to go. It, the results are, like you said, triple. Really incredible. Question for you, though. Yes, sir. A lot of time, baby. The tedium of, hey, Kate, how are you? How are the kids doing? Hey Russ, how are the how's the deer hunting going? How's the new car? The tedium of having to do that. Thoughts on that? Yeah, I agree. Um, one, I love that flex right there. I've been doing personalization for five years. Everybody get it? Um, but I love it. Bravo to you, sir. I think I think when you think about um, and that's the question that always comes back is how do you do personalization at scale, right? And so for me, it's like, how do we find, and it's a lot of experimentation. I wish I had like a better answer for you. I think it's a lot of experimentation of like, how can we just hone in on where, it, what matters most? Like our team is doing a lot of like, okay, if we narrow by job title, what does that look like, right? If we narrow by geography, what does that look like? If we narrow by industry, what does engagement look like? And trying to hone in on those pieces to find out what's the right combination for us. I, I wish I had a, an answer, but I don't. 